Hello and welcome to the news at this time. My name is Olajide Bello. Let's bring you the headlines. Nigeria observes special church service to mark 64 to dependence with a call for unity and hope for Nigeria's greatness. President Tinubu appoints Director General for China-Nigeria Strategic Partnership. South Africa embraces clean energy revolution to achieve biodiversity goals with clean energy. Now to the news in full. A special church service commemorating Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary has been concluded at the Economical Center Abuja with clerics calling for unity and expressing hope for Nigeria's greatness. The report. Governor Loki Ayedatua will read the only lesson from Romans 13, 1 to 10, express gratitude for the sacrifices made by ministers of the gospel, particularly their intercessions on behalf of the nation's leadership at all levels. He noted that the current economic hardships facing the nation are temporary, ensuring that President Bola Tinubu's administration is addressing the issues head on with plans to revamp and reposition Nigeria for greatness. The state government on its part, he reiterated, remains unwavering in its commitment to delivering the core values of good governance to stimulate growth of the state. We all deserve to be celebrated because in the last 64 years, we have successfully navigated the complex journey of nation building in spite of our diversity and obvious differences. Anglican Archbishop of Akure Diocese, Most Reverend Simeon Borokini, Emphasize that the 64th anniversary should remind Nigerians that freedom is precious, urging everyone to work collectively to preserve it. It is time to go back to God. Time to retrace our ways so that we can have the freedom of our mind and spirit. Prayers were offered for the country, on those states, the president and leaders at all levels as Governor Ayeda Tua led his cabinet in Thanksgiving. <laughs> In Akure, Paulo Mukago, NTA News. Sorry about that mix-up. That was actually the 64th uh, church service in Undo State. Moving on, Pope Francis has implored bishops not to cover up the sexual abuse of children. Instead, condemn the abusers and help them heal themselves of what he tags disease of abuse. He said this during an open-air mass on Sunday, capping a three-day visit to Belgium. According to the pontiff, evil must not be hidden. Evil must be brought out into the open so all perpetrators to be judged. The Belgian documentary earlier shown prompted around 200 more people to come forward with allegations that they were abused by members of the church, adding to around 1,000 cases reported before then. France's trip to Belgium was meant to focus on the 600th anniversary of two Catholic universities but uh, the church's record and abuse came to the fore. Report says uh, the issue had created feelings of horror, sadness, and helplessness. And Edmundo Gonzalez, the candidate of the Venezuelan opposition, made an appearance at a rally in Madrid, Spain, his fourth public engagement after leaving Venezuela. And polls open in Austria as far right hope for a historic victory. Colo Mohamed. Was a small. Edmundo Gonzalez, the retired diplomat, is seeking asylum in Spain after leaving Venezuela, where he had spent weeks in hiding following a contested election against Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. In the same vein, another opposition leader, Maria Corina Machado, is in hiding after denouncing the proclaimed results as fraudulent and called for smaller gatherings to avoid security crackdowns seen at earlier gatherings. At all gatherings by the opposition, the chants are usually calls on Maduro to leave office as they say he lost the election. Presidente, el mundo presidente, el mundo presidente. Hidalgo Valero, a retired colonel, said the freedom of Venezuela is in danger. In response, 
President Nicolas Maduro alleged that intelligence gathered indicates opposition leader Maria Corina Machado is preparing to head out of the country after failing to incite violence. Meanwhile, polls opened on Sunday in Austria in a general election expected to see the far right narrowly beat the conservatives for a historic win in the Alpine European Union nation. The Freedom Party, with top opinion polls, has been in government several times but has never won a national vote. Even though, if it wins, it is unclear whether it will be able to form a government. The Union Conservative People's Party has been lagging behind, even though its leader, Chancellor Karl Nehammer, pledged to narrow the gap in the build up to the general elections, promising stability instead of chaos. Colum Hamad. We go to South Africa where the energy landscape is changing as the country embraces the clean energy revolution. There are different views, however, on whether the country can achieve its biodiversity goals along with its clean energy targets. However, some experts believe it requires a substantial solution. Solar farms are being built in the Northern Cape and wind farms are going up in the Western Cape. But both provinces are also biodiversity hotspots, and clean energy projects take up a significant amount of land and can impact the environment. Some wind farms have been blamed for contributing to the deaths of many migratory bird species. However, some experts believe all solar energy should not be painted with the same brush. The environmental impact of the actual site itself Although it covers a relatively large footprint in terms of the way it's going down, the impact on the environment itself is very minimal because the solar panels themselves are above the ground, so they're ground mounted. There's a small little um, pole that goes into the ground, so there's minimal disturbance of the actual environment underneath the uh, solar panels. While the solar energy projects in the Northern Cape take up a significant amount of land, their design means that they have little impact on the succulent karoo biome. A fine balance needs to be struck between powering the economy through clean energy and increasing the country's biodiversity goals, which is set to increase by 12% in the next 20 years. And that is why the city of Cape Town is piloting floating solar technology in order to become carbon neutral by 2050. But some experts believe the technology will be at odds with protecting biodiversity. I think we know a lot about how green and blue technologies, as in the design and the nature-based solutions in terms of dealing with improved ecology of lakes, biodiversity always wins. So start to put in hard infrastructure, either in the edges of lakes or rivers, be they in the form of solar panels. And then I think you really are compromising what nature does. For now, many of the clean energy projects will continue to go through a rigorous environmental impact assessment to determine whether clean energy production biodiversity protection can be maintained. After more than 20 cases of Marburg virus confirmed in Rwanda, several deaths have been reported as the World Health Organization plans to send medical aid. Kolo Mohammed reports. Cases of Marburg virus have been confirmed in several districts of Rwanda. Some in isolation receiving treatment while dozens who came into contact with reported cases have been identified they have been monitored as authorities attempt to uncover the root of the infection the world health organization is doing all it can to help the country as it plans to send medical supplies to kigali from kenya in the coming days a who regional director for africa said with the country's already robust public health emergency response system WHO is collaborating closely with national authorities to provide the needed support to further enhance ongoing efforts. The virus belongs to the same family as the virus which causes Ebola, and the Marburg disease causes hemorrhagic fever and has a high fatality rate of up to 88%. Reports say it passed to humans from fruits, bats, and spreads between people through direct contact with the bodily fluids of infected persons. Kolo Muhammad, Antinus. Lebanon's army Sunday warned Lebanese against actions that could disturb public order in the crisis hit country after Israel's killing of Hassan Nasrallah, leader of the Iran-backed group Hezbollah. 
The army, in a statement, calls on citizens to preserve national unity and not to be drawn into actions that may affect civil peace at this dangerous and delicate stage. Hezbollah, the Shiite Muslim movement, whose militaries led to dwarf Lebanon's armed forces, has drawn criticism from some Lebanese politicians over its decision to open a support front against Israel over the Gaza war nearly a year ago. A Lebanese army official said troops have been deployed since Saturday in Beirut, where thousands have sought refuge from intense Israeli raids on Lebanon's south and east and on Hezbollah's south Beirut bastion. Vice President Kashim Shatima has returned to Abuja after successfully representing President Bola Ahmed Tinubu at the just concluded 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. The Vice President had presented Nigeria's national statements at the general debate, as well as engaged in several bilateral meetings and numerous sideline events at the General Assembly. He will proceed to join President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to mark some events put together as part of activities commemorating Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has appointed Joseph Olasukami Tegbe as Director General and Global Liaison for the Nigeria-China Strategic Partnership. This was agreed by the two countries during the President's visit in early September. Tegbe, a 1988 first-class graduate in civil engineering from Abafe Miaolo University, will report directly to the president. He is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. The statement by the special advisor to the president on information and strategy, Bayo Nonuga, says he will immediately submit a strategic action plan to enable Nigeria to benefit from the agreements between the two countries in Beijing. During his official visit before the FOCAC, President Tinobu also obtained a commitment from President Xi Jinping to support Nigeria's economic diversification plans infrastructure development. This is the news on NT International. It's time to take a short break. We will be back in a moment. Don't go away. Thanks for being there. Now to our earlier report, a special church service commemorating Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary has been concluded at the Economical Center Abuja, with Clarice calling for unity and expressing hope for Nigeria's greatness. Most Reverend Michael Akinwale in his sermon centered on Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream urged Nigerians to be nationalistic in their outlooks so that the country will leave a legacy of excellence for generations to come and make a lasting impact on their nations. Leaders including the President of the Senate, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Defense Chief, representatives of service chiefs and former President Olusegun Obasanjo attended the landmark service. Nigeria gained independence from British colonial rule on October 1, 1960, adopting a federal system with an elected prime minister and ceremonial head of state. This anniversary serves as a reflection on the country's journey and its diversity with a federal structure comprising three regions, eastern, northern, and western. And the federal government has handed over 64,100 capacity CNG buses to labor and student unions to enhance transportation and welfare of citizens. In a ceremony at the State House, Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohammed Idris and his counterparts, hailed the landmark event as a step towards utilizing greener energy. But we have about 64 of them to commemorate the 64th independence anniversary of our great nation. We have the 100 seater and we have the uh, seaters, all of them about 64. As we live here today, expect to see the CNG buses flying, not just the route of Abuja, but the routes of all the major cities and crannies of this country. Is to intervene on the side 
of the poor and the most vulnerable in the aftermath of what we all knew were necessary macroeconomic reforms to set the country on the path of economic stability. The buses will reduce the transportation costs for our workers traveling to and from their working places. So if you give us more buses, we'll announce you. We'll wait for the press to talk about it. We'll be talking it in the street. So we appreciate the bus, but we need more. Thank you. Are you having apathy in water transportation? Worry no more because inland water transportation has great potential to generate revenue not only for government at all levels but individual boat owners and workers in the sector. Provided the tribalization of safety rules on the part of everyone involved in the sector. That makes most Nigerians shy away from this massive income generating sector becomes a thing of the past. Larry Bile examines the need for attitudinal change on the part of passengers. There have been records of hazards bedeviling the nation's inland waterways. Is it the recklessness and incompetency of some captains and boat operators? Poorly constructed jetties, insufficient and substandard safety jackets, presence of waste on water surfaces, or the attitude of some passengers themselves? Water is completely different from road. If you have incidents on the road, you can stay by the roadside. You see help. You see somebody that will help you. A passerby will help you. But in water, as soon as the thing happened, your 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 time start counting. There is also issues of overloading from jetties based on connivance of some boat operators and passengers. Some operators lament on the tussle that often occurs between them and their passengers when they try to inform them about safety rules on water. Now, if we are loading, we ask some of them to just, the boat is, look at that boat now, you see. Before you know now, you see that the boat will start bending. She has not, they will know, know, they will know. If, if you go there and okay, try to balance the boat, they will start arousing us. So that we have to work, we have to take it personal within. Non-compliance of safety regulations has hindered the development of this transportation system. And this has made the federal government, through its agency, set up a constant monitoring system coupled with a gazetted document for all involved in inland water transportation in the country. In Lagos, Larry, Bilayi, and TNE. The National Hydroelectric Power Producing Areas Development Commission and Hyperdeck has distributed 33 modern fiberglass boats to 10 of its benefiting states to checkmate incidences of maritime tragedies in their various communities. The inauguration of the intervention initiative, which was held at the N Hyperdeck headquarters in Minanaja State, is part of the Commission's drive to make water transportation a safer source of livelihood. Fatima Usman reports. The choice of the 33 fiberglass boats by the National Hydroelectric Power Producing Areas Development Commission and Hyperdeck to 10 of its benefiting states is for its significant features of durability and safety as the boats offer superior navigation over wooden ones which are vital in mitigating the reoccurrence of boat mishaps that have plagued the riverine communities over the years. The initiative is also part of the Commission's broader vision to revolutionize marine transportation in all and hyperdeck communities by strengthening trade networks and enhancing community connectivity. Hyperdeck is actively protecting lives, easing transportation and ensuring that our waterways remain a source of livelihood. These boats are not simply a gift. They are a responsibility. You must ensure that they are maintained properly. Safety protocols are adhered to and that they are used for the benefit of all. People of vested interest at the engagement, including Managing Director Niwa, described the inauguration of the modern glass boat as life-changing for all waterways users, even as they solicit for more collaborative efforts in this sector. The 10 states that benefited from this gesture of the N Hyperdeck include Niger, Kogi, Kwara, Kaduna, Plateau, Nasalawa, Kebi, 
Benue, Taraba, and Bauchi states. In Mina, I am Fatima Usman, NTA News. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLA, has made several arrests and seizures across Nigeria, including two wanted kingpins, ex convict to front agents and an auto part dealer for drug trafficking. In a statement, Director of Media and Advocacy, NDLA, Femi Baba Femi, indicates the auto part dealer, one age of Nameka Chiwuze, was arrested for attempting to export heroin and cannabis hidden in lead lamps and sofa legs. Additionally, NDLA seized various drugs including tramadol, pentasozine, injection and cannabis destined for the US, UK, Canada, Australia, Thailand and Oman. Other arrests include a wanted drug kingpin Ajibo Damilari Samuel and a community leader Lahaji Bashir Mohammed Talba. The NDLA also conducted raids and arrests in several states, including Lagos, Kogi, Katsina, Niger, Kanu, Plateau, Oyo, and Edo, seizing substantial quantities of illicit substances. The agency continues its war against drug abuse and starvation lectures and advocacy visits nationwide. As part of measures to combat the twin menace of desertification and desert encroachment, Governor Ahmed Aliu of Sokoto State has flagged off the 2024 tree planting campaign with a call on people to desist from indiscriminate felling of trees to overcome environmental challenges confronting the state. The annual exercise took place at Project K500 housing units, Wamako local government area. Asmao Habibu Shagari tells us more. Sokoto State is one of the Nigerian states affected by desertification and desert encroachment. The northernmost part is particularly more vulnerable, with a significant size of its landmass affected by desertification, leading to losses in agricultural productivity and environmental degradation. This is as a result of deforestation, climate change, and soil erosion that require urgent attention and sustainable solutions to mitigate its impact. This year's tree planting campaign is part of efforts by governments to protect them from further degradation. Governor Ahmad Aliyu, who flagged up the campaign at the new 500 housing units under construction, underscores the significance of trees to the ecosystem. The governor hinted that his administration is exploring ways of harnessing liquefied natural gas for environmental friendly activities and urges people of the state to support government environmental policies and desist from indiscriminate cutting of trees to safeguard the environment. The governor directed all the local government councils in the state to commence tree planting immediately. Tree planting day in our state is not just a ceremony, but a firming commitment of government in safeguarding our environment. The success of our deep planting efforts depends on active involvement of everyone. This year's campaign theme in Sokoto State is greening our environment. From Sokoto, Asmao Habibu Shagari, NTA News. And on sports, two-time world heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua is at a crossroad after his humble defeat at the hands of fellow Brighton Daniel at Wembley. The 34-year-old was demolished in a powerful display by a man seven years his junior. The question now is not why, but how he lost the report. Anthony Joshua arrived at Wembley after four consecutive victories, including an impressive knockout win over Francis Ngono in March. But he was dominated by IBF heavyweight champion Daniel Dubois, who has lost two of his 24 fights. After being knocked down in the first round, Joshua hit the canvas several times more, including twice in the third, before the fight ended in the fifth. But what went wrong? Did Joshua lose his footing? Or was it a clever fix? There was a few mistakes in there, but that's the name of the game. Fine margins can cost you uh, at the top level. Despite losing to the 27-year-old and suffering the fourth defeat of his professional career, Joshua walked away from Wembley Stadium with a bigger purse. According to Sporty Salaries, Joshua was guaranteed to earn £6 million, but he could pocket as much as £25 million depending on pay-per-view sales. Dubai, on the other hand, is expected 
to earn at least 3.5 million pounds, potentially rising to 10 million pounds, depending on the success of the pay-per-view buys. People believe that he was trying to do a business game with all his fights, losing one, winning again, hoping on a rematch. You don't need that at this time. You need to leave a good legacy and a good name for yourself. What we saw of him in that fight against uh, Daniel Dubois shows one thing, and one thing very, very importantly, that uh, it does look like Anthony Joshua uh, has lost some sort of motivation. Some people feel, say that uh, since he's lost to Andy Ruiz, he's not been able to get himself back to the um, aggressive and vicious uh, state that he, he had been before now. It was a fourth career defeat for Anthony Joshua, following losses to Alexandra Usyk in 2021 and 2022 and underdog Andy Ruiz Jr. in 2019. So, with a long-awaited domestic blockbuster against Tyson Fury looking further away than ever, what happens now for one of Britain's greatest ever heavyweight fighters? For Sports Update, Bright Ebuchu, NTA News. And now I look at the weather updates for Monday in Nigeria and some parts of the world. And that is the news at this time. I am Olajide Bello. Many thanks for being a part of it.